So today, um, we have Duan Lei, who's giving us a presentation. He is a postdoctoral fellow at the Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies at the University of Michigan. His main research interest is social violence and state power in China. His current book project focuses on private gun ownership and its sociocultural and political implications in modern China uh, from the end of the Qing Dynasty all the way to liberation from 1860 to 1949. Uh, Dr. Duan received his PhD in 2017 from the Department of History at Syracuse University uh, after having an MA at uh, University of Massachusetts in history, uh, at University of Massachusetts Amherst in uh, 2011, and his uh, bachelor's degree is from Nankai uh, University in Tianjin, China. So today he's gonna speak to us, uh, uh, he'll be speaking on, uh, quote, uh, between arming and disarming, the culture and politics of private gun ownership in modern China. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Duan Lei. Thank you. <coughs> uh, can you hear me? Yeah, great. Uh, thank you so much for your generous introduction. I'm so glad to be here to present my research and my book project. And today I'm going to give you a general picture of my book uh, project, uh, which focuses on the social and uh, which focuses on the uh, private gun ownership in modern China from late 19th century to 1949. Uh, when talking about uh, the private gun ownership, it's a very sensitive uh, topic in today's US. But in China, it cannot be an issue in today's China, as we see that China today has the uh, most severe gun control laws. And Chinese government has a long time has imposed a ban on the gun ownership. So, it's not only the gun ownership, but any tools can be used as weapons are highly regulated or managed by the state. However, there was a period in Chinese history that private gun ownership was not prohibited. It's actually, it's allowed by the law. And this private gun ownership generated profound social, cultural, and political uh, implications in modern China. That is today's my, my uh, topic. So I will present 30 to 40 minutes, and then I welcome any comments and any questions. Thank you. So I will give you a few, in be, before doing that, I will give you a few examples how the different periods of government responded to the civilian gun ownership. On the top of it, the Song Yao San, Sun Yat-sen was a revolutionary, and he, his revolution overthrew the Qing dynasty uh, in 1911. In 19, early 1920s, Sun Yat-sen, the founding father of Republic of China, said, once the peasants are armed and rendered an effective force, they will be the country's first class master. So in practice, in early 1920s, when Sun Yat-sen organized nationalist revolution in Guangdong province, he sold the guns to the peasants from the military, encouraged the peasants to arm themselves and form militia forces. So his successor, Jiang Kai-shek, Jiang Kai-shek was China's uh, military and political leader in 1930s and 40s. After Jiang Kai-shek unified China in late 1920s, he ordered local government to make sure gun owners have their arms registered. And he also said we should inform the peasants, the people, that the government would never confiscate their weapons for military use. So this is said by Jiang Kai-shek in the early 1930s. Ten years later, Mao Zedong, Mao Zedong is, and most of you are familiar with, he established the People's Republic of China in 1949. He said we should take measures to mobilize armed people or feeling that to order villagers to turn in their weapons. If we do so, we can strengthen our presence in the region. So you can see that in the early 20th century, the three most important political fingers in, 20, in China had different attitudes, different policies, towards private gun ownership. So Sun Yat-sen encouraged peasants to arm themselves. Jiang Kai-shek wanted to manage, to regulate the own gun owners. Well, Mao Zedong planned to mobilize the private gun, owner, gun owners 
for political purposes. So this is the period that I look at. I look at the period from the late 19th century to 1949. Several reasons. During this period, private gun ownership was allowed by law. It's written in the law. And in the meantime, many people had guns. And they, so I focus on the private gun ownership. What do we mean by private? Private, I define the private by these individuals or groups who arm themselves <coughs> without revolutionary purpose. So they use the guns for, for personal use or for collective <coughs> purposes. So they were not military individuals or groups. <coughs> but during this period, China was um, ruled by different governments. Before 1912, it's Qing Dynasty. And then from 1912 all the way to 1949, China was, this was uh, the government was Republic of China. And until the 1949, the People's Republic of China was established by the Chinese Communist Party. But a big background of this time, <coughs> China during this time suffered from persistent warfare. And also Chinese society witnessed political decentralization and local militarization. And Chinese people had to re <coughs> encounter this in mounting civil insecurity from 1860 to 1949. So my book project wants to resolve two questions. The first question is why and how did Chinese people seek to arm themselves with guns? So I define this question is the social and cultural life of the gun in modern China. The second question I want to resolve is how did governments of different periods construct their relationship with armed civilians in society. So in general, there's two themes. One is so-called gun culture in China. Another is gun control or gun regulation in China. <coughs> so I want to, my book projects makes at least two arguments. The first, I argue that the civilian demand for guns were fueled by this guns provocative symbolism in popular culture and the social life. So the, the gun in China during this time means more than a tool for committing violence. It means more than that. Gun was a tool of for committing violence, but also is a source of social status. The use of gun shows one's determination, shows one's <coughs> uh, to show how one, uh, the individual to elevate their social status. And also it's a tool for self-empowerment. So, so all this symbolism coexisted and coerced in the modern China made the use of gun was not socially unacceptable. The second argument is the gun's regulation and control over the armed civilians. I argue that this was a dynamic process. The government adopted a control and reliance model to uh, construct its relationship with armed civilians. So one thing they want to, to make uh, the use of these gun owners to defend the localities. On the other hand, the government also maintained the monopoly over the, uh, monopoly on violence. So such political dilemma prevented the formation of an effective and consistent gun policy during this period. In general, my work wants to have some uh, a dialogue, uh, dialogue with ongoing, <coughs> uh, <coughs> excuse me, ongoing uh, uh, scholarly debate. One thing, previous studies on the gun focus exclusively on the military modernization in China and how Chinese government uh, imported or learned from the West to strengthen its military presence. But my project sets the privately owned guns in a social and a cultural context, and to, I want to explore the different ways that Chinese men and women responded to the gun culture in China. Second, my, <coughs> um, my analysis of the gun control or gun regulation policies allows me to evaluate 
the interaction between the state and society, and to prove how the private gun ownership complicated local society, and thus preventing this practice of the state power. And my book has one chapter talking about how Chinese Communist Party in 1940s, thir late 1930s and 1940s, mobilized the armed peasants. So that I was, I, this contributes the ongoing debate about how the CCP built its uh, grassroots organizations. So that's a general picture of my uh, book project and its general themes. So today, <coughs> I will present the two themes. One theme is the social and the cultural life of the gun. This section, I just want to resolve how and why Chinese people during this time armed themselves. Before doing that, I want to introduce two stories. The first, the, the, the first picture was by to, uh, Thomas Jernigan. He was an American diplomat who traveled broadly in China in the late 19th century. And he was also a hunting enthusiast. When he traveled, he took his uh, Winchester rifle with him. In the late 19th century, he said, well, Ch most Chinese people had no guns. Very few people used the guns. And he, he met some hunters, Chinese hunters, in the Yunnan province, in Guizhou province. And many of the guns they used were much just model loading the matchlock. The matchlock was introduced to China from Japan in the 15th century. So in this book, showed in China, Jernigan argued that Chinese gun fall behind the West as China fall behind West in civilization. So that is Mr. Jernigan made the argument in the late 19th century. <coughs> However, the second story is happened 30 years later. A Shi Jianqiao, this lady, she assassinated the former warlord Sun Quanfang in Tianjin in 1935 with an American manufactured Browning pistol. <coughs> the reason she killed Sun Quanfang is that Sun Quanfang killed her father 10 years earlier and she wanted to revenge for her dead father. So this case, the Shi Jianqiao's uh, story just provoked a, a lot of debate in 1930s in Tianjin and in many places. Most of the debate talks about the role of the law and the role of failure penalty, why Shi Jianqiao assassinated the Sun Quanfang. I look at this, this case differently. Shi Jianqiao used American manufactured Browning pistol. But if we combine these two stories together, we can find something transformative. The first, as Mr. Jernigan said, in the late 19th century, very few Chinese people had guns. But 30 years later, Shi Jianqiao could get access to the pistol to commit violence. The second, like she, uh, Mr. Jernigan said, Chinese people used the march lock. In China, it's called bird guns. So called the Niao Qiang, it's bird guns in the late 19th century. However, in 1935, Shi Jianqiao used a foreign gun manufactured by an American company. So that case attracted me and it allowed me how popularity of the private gun ownership. So I then read a lot of documents. I read uh, these social survey reports criminal cases, government documents. It helped me figure out the proliferation of private gun ownership in modern China. And I found out this, this period, the gun ownership was a nationwide phenomena. And I focused on this, a few provinces as my case studies, like Guangdong province, Shandong, Henan pro provinces. For example, in Guangdong province, here, because it's very close to, next to Hong Kong and Macau, a lot of foreign weapons poured into this region in the late 19th century. In uh, a 1924 so, uh, 
a social in a survey report shows me in Guangdong province, there were at least four million guns ho uh, holding by these people, non-military individuals. So many of the gun owners were urban or rural doublers. They were also peasants, landlords, or, and also bandits. A lot of bandits had guns in Guangdong province. Uh, in the 1950s, when the, the new government, the communist government, confiscated almost uh, 500,000 guns in Guangdong province. This based on my, the, uh, the government document. Uh, so Guangdong has a lot of guns. Like in Henan and Shandong, Henan province, Henan in 1930s, for example, the nationalist government conducted a social investigation in Henan and it also called for the gun registration records. So a lot of the government sent work, uh, work teams to register the, uh, the private gun owners. There was almost 300,000 guns were registered with the government in Henan province. So many of these weapons, sorry, oh yeah. So why that Chinese people aimed to arm themselves with guns? So different people assign different meanings to the gun. They assign different symbolic values to their weapons. I consider the different gun owners. For example, this picture it shows, and he's, he's holding a, um, a, Colt, a Colt pistol. The use of foreign guns, the guns was not manufactured in China or manufactured by Chinese arsenals. They were imported abroad. The foreign guns were extremely popular among the wealthy class in Shanghai, in Tianjin, and in Beijing. I went to the archive in Beijing, in Shanghai, and Tianjin. I noticed that this archive maintained a relatively complete records, gun registration records, from the 1930s and then after 1945. From this gun registration records, it, show, it shows me how the diff, what type of gun Chinese people used. The f and also the personal information of these gun owners. The first gun, the, the most Chinese people, the urban wealthy class, they preferred foreign guns rather than Chinese guns. The first guns, they preferred the Browning for, uh, most, followed by the Colt and the Mauser. There are some other guns, like the Chinese uh, manufactured Hanyang uh, pistol or Hanyang rifle, and also some other guns. But most Chinese people used the gun, most Chinese urban wealthy class used the foreign guns rather than Chinese weapons. So I read their the private writings of these some urban wealthy class. They use the gun to show their elevated social status, especially these foreign guns made in America or made in Germany showed how they embrace modernity. It's a gun is a label of social status. It's not, the social meaning of the gun was not confined to the, uh, the committing uh, the violence. It means more than that. The second reason that they what they use a the gun is the gun was a symbol of self-empowerment, especially when the government was not able to provide prote uh, uh, protection to the, uh, to the people. People use a gun to protect themselves or they use a gun to form a collective defense force. So that is a symbol of self-empowerment and also that challenged the power structure in local society. The thing is many Ambitious individuals or strong men, they translated their access to the weapons into the, into the local power. The use of arms became de decisive in some regions, as my case studies show. Uh, the use of weapons became decisive in the, uh, maintaining their dominance in local society. In the wartime China, the social meaning of the gun was subject to change. The piece, uh, in Chinese traditional culture, the use of gun was not 
socially acceptable. According to Confucianism or Taoism, the gun was the tooth for evil de of evil design. But in the early 20th century, the gun, the use of views, the, uh, the view of weap weaponry was, has changed. In the wartime China, a lot of pop, the, the image of gun appeared in a lot of popular uh, culture. Like the first one, to give me the spare and take up the gun to fight enemies. Or a, a very popular slogan in the rap, mobilizing the armed civilians. So that means the use of the gun, it shows one's determination to defend the nation against the foreign invasion. So we see that different people had different purposes or they assign different social meanings to the gun. The one new thing that fresh to me is the women's use of the guns. This lady, she won the shooting competition in 1928 in Shanghai. That's a common in, uh, in Tianjin, Shanghai, and Guangdong, in, and in Canton. The shooting club were, organized, were established in the early 20th century for this urban wealthy class to practice shooting. Like this lady in 1928, she won a shooting competition in May. And it shows from this picture, it shows me how he embraced modernity. She's holding a, a, cold, a cold pistol and wearing a teapot. So I, would, I argue that the introduction of foreign guns equalized the power discrepancy between women and men. At the next month in the June, her husband won another shooting competition. So the, the foreign gun, especially the introduction of semi-loading and semi-automatic pistol made non-military non individuals to uh, use their weapons easily. Yes. Um, that make uh, the women and also the non-military individuals the use of gun possible. In the wartime, like my case in Guangdong province shows, the local women organized the all-female militia forces to protect their villages in wartime China. When their husbands were drafted into, into the army, the local women, they organized themselves and they got the weapon from the government to protect the villages. That shows their engagement with the local and the regional politics. And I argue that the use of the gun legitimated their engagement with local and national politics. So now my puzzle next is how did Chinese people obtain the guns? What I mentioned, we have to consider the urban and rural divide. The people had different, from different regions, they had different ways to, uh, to uh, get access to the weapons. Like the urban wealthy class, the uh, people in Shanghai and in Tianjin and in Beijing, they, many of the urban wealthy class used the foreign guns. And, and then I, from this gun registration records, the Browning, Code and the Mauser were re extremely popular among these armed civilians in Shanghai. So I went to the Connecticut State Archive years ago, and I, there I found the code uh, documents. From the late 19th century to the early 20th century, Western firearm companies faced this lumping uh, domestic sales. So they turned their attention to China as China's uh, mounting a civil insecurity serve as a potential market. For example, the code in early 20th century, they sent uh, sales representatives to China in large numbers. And also they printed their advertisement in Chinese to attract the Chinese consumers. Well, their consumers were this middle class and wealthy people in the urban centers. What you can see that they sh showed, like code, the code was, they showed this, their weapons was the most accurate, most reliable, and most stable guns in China. But many of these weapons 
manufactured by the West was very expensive, and for the most common people, it's hard to get access to these expensive weapons. Other ways, the three other ways, one is the diffusion of military weapons in local society. This chart, it shows the spread of warfare in China and under the early republic. From 1912 to 1930, almost every province in China suffered from persistent warfare. Uh, many cases show me that after each battle, many weapons were simply abandoned on the battlefield. And these weapons were then later picked up by local peasants or local uh, militia leaders. So many l l militia leaders collected, collected these guns to form a collective defense forces. Or these guns were then picked up by the bandits to commit violence. The third way is the gun smuggling. I uh, collected the sources from the, uh, the custom records. The rip you can see that from the train, you can see after the first uh, world war, a huge numbers of the guns poured into China, the used guns poured into China, uh, through Shanghai, through, uh, through Shanghai or uh, Guangdong or Tianjin, from the, uh, the, uh, the ways of smuggling. Finally, the private manufacture of guns. In the late 19, uh, in the early 20th century, especially 1930s and 40s, when the Chinese people used the foreign guns, they gave these guns the, the, uh, the uh, uh, prefix the foreign. Foreign denotes more than or superior. However, the foreign guns means the gun manufactured abroad or the guns manufactured by China. Many foreign guns, they were also made, the guns made in China, but they followed the foreign design. So in Henan province and Shandong province, uh, as my, some of my case studies show, the local landlords or local gentry, they organized or they operated the manufacture work, the workshops to manufacture the foreign guns. They learned the copy, the learned design of foreign guns and manufactured a lot of counterfeits. So that is most how Chinese peasants uh, obtained their weapons. So for the, so this is my uh, argument about the social and cultural life of gun. The gun in China means more than violence, but it shows the people's elevated so, uh, social status. And so shows how per, uh, the individuals empower themselves through the, per, uh, through the access of the gun. And it also shows how the, the gun means how to engage with national and po local politics. But the private gun ownership in modern China accelerate, accelerated this local militarization. They transformed the power structure in local society, challenged the central authority. So from the late 19th century, how did the state, the governments of different periods, construct their relationship with the armed civilians? So that's my second theme, the regulating, controlling, or mobilizing the civilians' guns. What I argued is the Chinese governments from the late Qing Dynasty to 1949, their policies towards private gun ownership based on two ideologies. The first, the, gov the government relied on the social power to defend their localities. And the second, they also have, have the desire to maintain the monopoly on violence. So in the late Qing Dynasty, the Ch late Qing government changed their policy on the, uh, their policies on the private gun ownership. The Qing code, the Qing code, and many criminal cases of the Qing confirm that the carrying of firearms by civilians was prohibited, and the penalty of for viol uh, viol uh, violation was severe. And in the early 
20th century, in 1910, the later Qing government, for the third, first time, cha uh, changed their Great Qing Code by enacting a new criminal law to, prom uh, to allow the people to have their guns. And people's, the private gun ownership was allowed uh, if they were properly managed. In the Republican period, the nationalist government allowed these people they defined as good civilians to use guns. They guaranteed their, self, their means of self-defense. On the one hand, they, well, they, they issued the gun license. This was a national policy of gun licensing in China. And on the other hand, the nationalists also merged the control of gun ownership with the Baojia system. So is an administrative mechanism for local control and civilian, uh, civilians. Well, however, these gun regulation uh, efforts was not consistently adopted. What I argue is that this, there was an ineffectiveness of gun regulation efforts. For example, one case that I, in my uh, dissertation, in my book project, in Henan and Shandong province. These two provinces had many guns than the other surrounding provinces. In 1940, for example, so Wei Gongzhi, she conducted a social survey in Henan province. She was a communist cadre. She said almost every county in the west and south Henan province had more than 10,000 guns in the hands of civilians. That's in Henan province. The same also happened in the western Shandong province. Well, what Chinese, the nationalist government did in the early 1930s, the nationalist government ordered to register the gun owner. And in the early 1930s, the military governor of Shandong listened to the advice of Liang Shuming to, confess, to collect the guns owned by these uh, uh, peasants and then distributed these guns to local militia forces. So in so doing, the Shandong military governor and nationalist government planned to form a collective defense forces in Shandong province. However, such policy provoked anti-government outrages in Shandong province. And the, the peasants in Shandong feared their means of self-defense, they uh, feared they would lose their means of self-defense. So Jiang Kai-shek received a lot of reports from Shandong province saying the, the uh, popular movement in Shandong, these pe peasants rejected or their gun reg uh, regulation policies. And to avoid this tension, Chiang Kai-shek quickly ordered Shandong authorities in the early 1930s to return their guns and to require them not to register any private weapons. So especially during the wartime in 19, uh, from 1937 to 1945, Chiang Kai-shek in Chongqing, first in Nanjing and then in Chongqing, more than once issued order to local societies, local governments, stop registering any Gun, uh, any privately owned guns to avoid this escalating tension between the, the pad, armed peasants and uh, the local uh, and the local governments. So what I can see from this case, it shows the government policy in the 1930s and the 40s towards private gun ownership was not consistent. They relied on these armed civilians to defend localities. Especially these local strongmen, they controlled local society that made and helped the government access to, lo to, uh, access to this local society. For the other hand, the government wanted to maintain the monopoly over violence, but this dilemma pro uh, prevented the formation of an, uh, consistent gun policies in modern China. And such lax gun control policies by the nationalist government allowed the Chinese Communist Party, 
to mobilize the peasants, the armed peasants. The Chinese Communist Party in 1930, uh, uh, late 1930s and 1940s in North China showed me that they emphasized the strategic significance of, of armed civilians in sustaining its revolutionary enterprise. If we remember this very famous quotation by Mao Zedong, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. The CCP's policies and practices with the private gun ownership also shows how they emphasized the significance of armed people, not only, not only the armed, uh, the military power. In practice, the Chinese Communist Party adopted the class struggle theory to mobilize people to organize, to make use of these guns. Like this cartoon, it shows when the Communist, Communist Party reached one single village, the first thing they did is to conduct social investigation to figure out how many guns were held by the peasants or landlords and what types of guns they used and who was a local strongman or gentry. And then what they did is to think, of, to think about how to mobilize this, uh, to mobilize these gun owners. They organized the armed civilians into guerrilla units or they confiscated the private guns for the CCP's military use. So if we look at the, non, the, the Communist Party, their activities in 1930s and uh, 1940s, a lot of policies like land reform were carried out. And, but my funding shows me the, uh, the CCP used the similar strategies in the land reform to collect or to mobilize the armed civilians. Public education meetings were held. Uh, the first, they organized, they uh, mobilized the peasants, the armed peasants, because the armed, the peasants, the, the landlords had more guns than the peasants. They persuade the peasants to force the landlords to give up their guns. Well, if the landlords rejected, well, they were lab uh, these landlords were labeled as class enemies. So some public session, public struggle meeting, or uh, critical session were, uh, were held to force the Chinese, the landlords and local society to, uh, to give up their weapons. So my research, I try to, I try to weave together the social and cultural and institutional histories. I navigate both the national politics and the social realities. In general, I want to consider these, the uh, circulation of the guns and the social meaning to Chinese people, and also the state regulations towards private gun ownership and these responses in the local practice. Based on this project, I try to explore another project, another ongoing project is after 1949, how the Chinese governments disarmed the civilians after the founding of the People's Republic. What I mentioned in the uh, in 1930s and 40s, the Chinese Communist Party in North China mobilized the, uh, the uh, armed civilians. Actually, they encouraged people to have the arms and used class struggle to uh, mobilize these armed civilians. But in the early 19, uh, 1950s, the Chinese Communist Party used a similar strategies to disarm the people. They were good at using the uh, class struggle session, class struggle, class struggle uh, theory by mo mobilizing the peasants to force the landlords or the local, local bullies to, con uh, con to give up their wep weapons, to surrender their weapons. So in 1950, 1949, from 1949 to 1953, the Communist government used the counter-revolutionary campaigns and to mobilize, uh, to uh, collect the guns from the uh, local armed 
uh, civilians. The second ongoing project I want to consider is how the state actors sectioned the representations of social violence in popular culture to claim the legitimacy for the state in 20th century. In the end, I want to show these pictures to show how the government had a very inconsistent position towards private gun ownership. In Beijing, the, the Tiananmen Square in the center of Beijing, there is a monument to the people's heroes. This monument was uh, erected in 1958. On the base of this monument, there are eight bar reliefs. Each bar relief depicts one significant revolutionary episode, uh, incident in Chinese history. On the west side of this bar relief, this, uh, the, this bar relief was used to celebrate the victory of the Second Sino Japanese War. This relief did not depict the most significant uh, campaigns fought by the Chinese Communist Party, but it emphasized the contributions made by the people. For in the right, you can see an old lady. Lady, she gave her son a rifle and persuaded her son to fight against the Japanese invasion. It shows me to me that the Chinese Communist Party before the 1949 encouraged people to use their arms against the foreign invasion against and to fight for the CCP agenda. But after 1950s, when the new government established, the new communist party, the uh, new communist government quickly disarmed the people. So it shows the government attitudes towards private gun ownership was a dynamic process. Uh, it's determined by this particular social and political situations. It's not consistent, and that is the, the, the major uh, thesis of my uh, project. Well, I think that is my general picture of my dissertation, uh, my dissertation and my book project, and then I welcome any questions and comments. Thank you. Just curious about the visibility of guns in the Republican era. Mm -hmm. You can think about the US, for instance, some people will have a gun over the mantelpiece. Yeah. It's not as popular as it once was, right? Mm -hmm. You have collectors who will have a chest of guns that will show off. Nowadays, we have people who are running around purposely showing that they're carrying guns, going to mm -hmm. polling places mm -hmm. and things like that. And so it was a tendency in the Republican period to keep the guns hidden would this guy, for instance, have a pocket mm -hmm. that he would have his gun? And how often would you see them? Also, how about in movies? Were Western movies shown in China? And was there any influence in that in domestic movies? Western movies are all about guns, right? Mm -hmm. It's ahistorical, but still, that's one of the places where you saw guns the most, probably, in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the question. It's, a, it's how, to, how people display their, dis display their guns. Uh, we'll have the different people have different uh, ways to, to show their, uh, their weapons. Uh, if I, I read many the popular literature or these newspapers in 1920s and 30s in Shanghai, uh, like this gentleman, she, he used a gun to show his pi uh, uh, coat pistol publicly. To sh actually, he's not using the gun to commit violence, but show he has some very uh, fancy Western weapons. And that means how he proved his, he embraced modernity. So it's a, the gun in that time, I read some private writings of these urban gun owners. They show the use of a gun, especially the gun made in the US or made in Germany, the Mauser, is a symbol of modernity. It's a symbol of how they, uh, their, their uh, elevated social status. So they, tr they enjoy the process of showing their, 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 their weapons publicly. Like this gentleman and also this um, wealthy lady in Shanghai. Uh, what you, you, your, with your question about movies, right? Mm -hmm. 
I, I do not they, uh, use a lot of movies in my uh, project, but I can see that the image of the gun in the movies mostly, I, I mostly focus on the gun symbolism as violence. It's a violent, uh, uh, so it's a tool for committing violence. It's a, the guns used by the bandits, used by the criminals, used by this uh, not so-called the good civilians. So this is one part of the how this uh, different symbolism of the of social different symbolism apply to the gun. Yeah, this is a part of the story. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, um, I was just wondering like how the use of guns um, in China compared to that of like Japan and if they were like less modern at the time if like Japan's guns were more advanced and if that like affected the future battles that be like were between the two countries. Uh, so your question is this, what period, this period, 20th century, early 20th century. Uh, well China, this, during this time, they used the guns a lot uh, from Japan, just, just the connections. A lot of guns from Japan smuggled to China in the 19, uh, from late 19th century to the 1930, 1930 uh, 30 and 40s. A lot of guns, of course, and, and also some Chinese arsenals, they manufactured Japanese style weapons. The, uh, the rifles or uh, the small arms, uh, they learned a lot from Japan. Um, but the, what's the connection? In the, uh, the difference between China and Japan, for I think that the use of gun in Japan during this during this time showed how the rise of militarism in Japan. But China, yes, the use of gun in China accelerated the local militarization. That is, I think, the similarity. But in Ch in China during this time, uh, the use of a, of the gun means not only this militarization. But means more than that. It, uh, well, I my, my project shows the use of a gun. How the, the gun shows the people's engagement with their local politics, and how the people how the use of a gun shows how the their their determination against foreign division, foreign invasion, and to show their uh, different social meanings. And I think that is the major difference with uh, with Japan. Thank you. Oh yeah, well, one thing I want to uh, highlight is. The first gun, the China, the, uh, the firearm China used were introduced from Japan in the Ming Dynasty, 15th and 16th century. And however, uh, Japan gave up the gun in the Tokugawa period, in uh, 16th century, uh, uh, from 15th century. So the gun was no was no longer used, was not allowed to be to, to use in Japan. But China continues to use the use the gun, the matchlock, but stop developing is any advanced um, firearm technology until the late Qing Dynasty. So some connections, the late Qing Dynasty, why I, can, why I start my project from late 19th century, that's when the Chinese government started a military modernization learn, and well, the J Japanese weapons played a big role in China to, to advance the military technology. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, your topic's very uh, practical. So I simply want to know, uh, you know, there is a heated debate in America here, mm -hmm. whether American uh, Mark government should ban the gun, okay? So what would you say to President Trump in terms of gun control? Thank you. Uh, this is a very, thank you for a question. Uh, this is a very different political uh, circumstances between China and the US. Well, I will answer this question first from the perspective of history, the period. Why during this period many people had guns in China? Uh, one reason is in China, this period China suffered from political decentralization. And the central government became, this government was weak and the society, the society became strong. That made the local, pe uh, the people to, to, pers to pursue our weapons 
to empower themselves. Uh, well, that's a big that's a big background when the the public political decentralization led to local militarization in China. But from perspective of today, why China today has a very different uh, gun, very different uh, uh, gun control policies from the U.S. China, it, because of this, the centralized China has a centralized state much effectively to inf to enforce its gun control policy. I think that is uh, when we consider the, the difference between the China and the U.S. We have to consider the uh, the, the power of the of the state and the power of the central government, uh, how effectively they uh, control or to regulate the private gun ownership. I think that is a very different uh, political uh, uh, background between these two countries. And another this case I want to share with you is many years ago the study hook in the Connecticut the the the, uh, the school shooting incident is a tragedy. But the same day in China they have a there another case the same the same day of that the Sandy Hook. China has a similar case. A man went to the school to kill pretend he wants to kill the, the children in the school. The thing is that he failed because he had no access to the gun. What he used, he used is a knife to uh, enter the school, but he failed. So after that case, I read some newspaper critic, some newspaper articles to make comparison between these two cases. It shows how effectively the China uh, maintained its monopoly on violence. Hi, thanks. And uh, this is a, a really interesting topic, and I think one of the reasons is because you, as you point out, it has the gun has these social functions, but then also these cultural functions that go side by side. They're symbols as well as these sort of tools for mm -hmm. violence or defense. Um, and I'm wondering, in the cultural side of that, how you see this history being mobilized or used in the present. So that you know, yours is an academic history of, of the past, mm -hmm. way it is, but parallel to you, there's also this discourse about this time period. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking particularly like Ron Zidane Fay and the Let the Bullet Fly, it, where it has this moment where there's exactly the collection of guns and then the distribution of guns, which was probably the first time I ever heard about <laughs> this. And so it was in a present day cultural context rather than the past. And I'm wondering how you think people think about this past now mm -hmm. in the present. Uh, uh, this is gr great question. Thank you. The thing, uh, what I, for in my work, I showed well how Chinese urban wealthy class they was so enjoyed the use of the foreign guns. So I think that we can I consider these guns not only as a as a so we consider the different uh, identities of the weapon of the gun. So one thing, gun is a tool to come to protect themselves and to protect uh, to uh, to commit violence. For the other, the use of the the gun, we can also define the gun as a common commodities. And the people's use of a gun, I can connect that with the consumerism and with the uh, the uh, the f the cons how people consume the the foreign commodities in China. I think that, that is uh, there's some similarities. If you look at this period of history and today's history, to, uh, today's China, and how people perceive uh, perceived the foreign commodities, perceived and how people um, sim uh, symbolized these foreign commodities and show. To apply their the social meanings to their commodities, I think that is one thing that make this connection uh, between the history and present. Uh, for another, well, I think this period people why the people use the gun. One of the reason they give the the title of the gun the self self defense weapon. So the uh, so called the the the, 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 the 
this was a very this was a popular term in 1930s and 40s. And why people required the self defense is especially because uh, they have a, a uh, they, they have encountered this mounting civil insecurity. And why the self self defense was necessary and when it was not necessary. And uh, we'll look at today, after 1949, the, why the Chinese Communist Party was able to collect the guns from the people. One propaganda, a lot of propaganda, the uh, campaign during that time shows what the new government provided, provided protection to the people, so the self-defense was not necessary. So that is public, uh, a lot of this is a major theme of the public education meetings. I think that is a, what we can consider why the people use the guns from the from perspective of culture. Thank you. I have a maybe totally not related, but one of the major there is in the Olympic Games, mm. the whole section where guns and shooting and everything are done. And I only know from a former student who won gold medals that you know it was private. It was not in the military. Does China include people competing in these sections in the Olympics? And if so, where did they come from? I mean, could a private citizen mm -hmm. also participate, as is the case here? Like today's China, there's a lot. Uh, well, in today, uh, if go in Beijing, in Shanghai, the shooting club was still uh, I, I operated in, in Beijing and Shanghai. Uh, like all you said, Olympic Games, the 1984, the China after, um, the 19, 1984, the China, the first, the gold, the gold medal was by the Chinese, the, the shooting competition, China, 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 China won. So I think that is was a lot of this shooting competition, a uh, shooting competition for uh, events or shooting club were organized in the urban, in some cities in today's Shanghai and today's uh, Beijing by this emerging middle class, uh, that they were not allowed to, to obtain their weapons for private use, but they, uh, they, were, they were allowed to practice in this privately owned enterprise, this shooting club, that was al allowed. For, uh, I think in, if, Today, the use of the weapon in China is not a big issue. The government allow, in, in law, the Chinese government today allows people to have the hunting guns or to have the gun uh, like for inter entertainment. However, the state will never issue any gun license to the people, even though it's allowed by the law. But some of these activities, like you said, the shooting activities, have to be sectioned by the state. But that is uh, possible, but it's hard. Yeah. I think, I hope that's answered your question. Uh, I have a question um, regarding the Xi'an Shi Bian. Mm. After that time, w uh, did the Kuomintang do anything different about gun policy? Did they? Uh, uh, were the effective against the Japanese? All right. Uh, thank, uh, good question. The uh, Xi'an should be after the Xi'an incident, the Chinese, the Kuomintang, the KMT, and the CCP formed the second United Front against foreign invasion. Uh, well, after the incident, is I have I have answered the question in two points. First, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, well, uh, this the they became officially recognized by the state, right? However, I read the Jiang Kai-shek, the diary of Jiang Kai-shek, and also the government documents in Taiwan, in Nanjing. In the 19, after the Xi'an incident, when the, the, the Chinese Communist Party, they were allowed to operate in, the North, in, North, China, in North China. However, a lot of letters were sent to Jiang Kai-shek to report how the CCP did not fight the Japanese, but conf mobilizing or confiscating the guns owned by the peasants. Uh, 
Jiang Kai-shek, all, Jiang Kai-shek, after Jiang Kai-shek received the letter, or this military reports, he had nothing to do. The thing is, is for, that's why what I see, this nationalist government's gun control policies was undercut by regional power bloc. Uh, the, especially after 1937, 19, 19, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party just actively mobilizing the armed civilians, armed peasants in the north. That's a, this one uh, point. Another point, after 19, uh, 1937, when China entered this war, so-called wartime, government was reluctant to register the guns. It's, for them, it's said it's hard, it's impossible to register or to manage all the gun owners. So the Jiang Kai-shek, if I read many of his writings or his government documents, he stopped it, uh, registering, registering these gun owners, to, because many peasants or the, uh, the local strongmen, they feared the gun registration records, reg gun regulation might uh, make them lose their means of self-defense. So that means the uh, government allowed people to use their guns without any regulation. Uh, just to make, to one day they have to make use of these gun owners to defend the localities, or to avoid any, any attention. Yeah. It might be that I've seen more illustrations from late Qing and early Republican era than later on. But it, I do have a strong impression that precisely during that period, you begin to see school students being trained to use guns, mm -hmm. which is very different, right? Mm -hmm. And so and that would also uh, relate to the idea that traditionally, soldiers are not good, haren bu dang bing. And so we see a kind of change in that attitude at the same time. And so I was curious whether that just strikes me because it's new, this idea of teaching school kids to use guns. Is, does it kind of pass, or is it continued throughout the Republican period? Now, I'm not talking about military academies at all, just ordinary yeah. schools. Uh, yes, that's true. From the late 19th century, actually, uh, very, very uh, few, or in the late 19th century, but in the Republican period, the military training that uh, in the school, in the uh, middle school, high school, that is uh, popular, and that's what's uh, encouraged by the state. Uh, many so, uh, students in the school, they practice shooting. But the, of course, sometimes it's not the real shooting, but they just mock practice. Uh, that is what, what we see that how the state in a section, the, the, how state used the physical strength to stress the people, to stress the nation. I think that's a part of it. Uh, the shooting by the, by the students, that's, that's true. Uh, even like after the 1949, the military training by the, stu by the students that's also continued to be existed. Even I, uh, even I received my military training, I practiced shooting. Uh, but the thing is, is these guns, many of guns, of, of, of course, the, the trainings by the students or by the schools, their guns more far inferior than the military weapons. And that what I want to highlight is the, the state allowed people to use guns, but in the legal terms, they have a very clear dif distinction, a di very clear difference between the civilian weapons and military weapons. And what kind of weapons could be used by the civilians, but that is regulated by the law. Uh, however, well, the, uh, the training, that, that, that's, that's right, but uh, for others, However, such legal pra practice is not that effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have one more clip. Should I do one more question? Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to thank Le Duan for his talk. And thank you so much. <laughs>